quite a while since I've done a yoga whiteboard. So today I figured it was time to bring it back and this one has quite a lot of information on it. When we're getting ready to do a new teacher training, something that I spend a lot of time thinking about is how can we create better yoga teachers? How can we create teachers who are more skilled and more effective and have a greater understanding of what yoga is? I feel like that's one of my, my personal missions is to create better educated yoga teachers. And for me, one of the specialties that I kind of focus in on is anatomy because I have more training in that than your average yoga teacher. But that's just one tiny piece of really being a great yoga teacher. So what I've broken it down into are these four categories that come up consistently. And you can see I have represented them by these four different circles that intersect and overlap in so many different ways. And this is still kind of a work in progress for me, thinking about how things fit together in the big scope of being a yoga teacher. But I'll go through some of the main categories to start. The first circle here, and these are in no particular order, the first circle here I put the postures and the anatomy. So think tangible, physical, studying the body systems, talking about alignment, what's happening in the joints when you're doing a certain asana. And then that intersects with the next circle, which is knowledge and understanding of the subtle body the parts of the body that we can't see or touch, that we can't necessarily talk about in the most scientific way, but I think are so integral to what we do as yoga teachers, understanding how these practices cause changes in our energy. We could talk about the chakra system, the nadis, the concept of prana as that life force that animates us, we could go into the values and um, just emotions in general and how emotion a lot of times is talked about as energy in motion, like energy shifting and moving. So that really ties in strongly to the subtle body. And then we swing over to this next category, which is yoga philosophy. And there's so many different components that also go into the yoga philosophy, but the yamas and the niyamas are usually some of the first foundation work that we study. The yoga sutras and some of the classical texts that are associated with yoga. The klesha system and um, just the overall idea of energy and consciousness. There's a lot of overlap into those two sections. So then we come up to that fourth major circle. And this is the one that I think might not be quite as obvious, but it's so integral to being effective as a yoga teacher. And that is this idea of relationship and connection. And we start from a foundation of working on our relationship to ourself, using yoga in a way that we get to know ourselves better and our habits and our tendencies all of that is so helpful to understand first and then we are able to work on connection the connection that we have to the people around us the connection that we form with our students the connection that we have to the practice of yoga and maybe to our peers our other teachers or our other yoga students all of that stuff is really essential and I think as a yoga teacher, you could be the best educated, you could know everything about anatomy and the bones and be able to talk about every single nadi and energy channel in the body and have the yamas and the niyamas memorized. But if you can't create that connection and that relationship to the student, we won't be able to effectively use that knowledge to pass it on to help somebody else. And that's such a big part of why so many people get into teaching yoga is we want to take this information, distill it and pass it down to somebody else for it to be useful to them. So this part 
is key to that whole process happening. And that's also why I see yoga teacher training as being something that needs to be really experiential. That whole process of transitioning from being a student to being a teacher, you have to take a deeper dive into what do the postures do? What effect do they have? The meditation practices, what effect do they have? Really spending a lot of time in personal practice to build a stronger connection between you and the practice of yoga, and that will make you more effective at conveying it to somebody else. So those are the four major spheres that I see. The, the physical body awareness, the postures and the anatomy, the subtle body and the energy awareness, the yoga philosophy and the texts, and then this sphere of relationship and connection skills. All of them intersecting to that little point in the center. That is where a really skilled and effective yoga teacher resides. Now, you're looking at all of these different topics on the board and you're thinking, okay, well, that's like probably three lifetimes worth of study. And um, yoga is a very deep and a very wide field. There's so much that goes into this. And I think if you're new to yoga, sometimes that can feel a little bit overwhelming because there is so much information. But really, I like to look at it from a point of fe feeling how exciting is that, that we have so much that we can learn. I mean, there's no end to what we can read and what we can practice. It's a never ending source of knowledge and interest that we can just keep working with. So try to think of it in that way. And you would actually be surprised a few years of dedicated study, you would really be surprised how much you can absorb when you are using resources that are effective and Maybe you have a teacher who has studied all of these things and can effectively distill that and pass it on to you. There's a couple different things that go into that. Now, in terms of how we educate yoga teachers, this is not all going to be instilled in you in 200 hours. It's just, it's too much. 200 hours is your very basic platform on which to start building your skills. It's like the day that you graduate from teacher training, that's when your real education begins because now you have the foundation to build on. And it's years and years and years of learning after that and working on your craft. And I think one of the ways that we can support the profession and create better yoga teachers from the beginning is to encourage mentoring programs. The teachers who have been teaching for long periods of time have gone through all sorts of trial and error and um, experiential learning of their own. And that is so valuable to pass on to a new teacher who's just coming into the field and sort of trying to get their bearings of what this whole process is about to be in the role of a teacher. So that's also why I support a lot of experiential learning, a lot of practical application, getting out there and teaching. Because after you teach, you can self-reflect. There's that svadhyaya, that self-study. But what I like to do after I teach a class, and I still do this almost 15 years in, I'll teach a class and then I'll say to myself, okay, what went well? And what could I have done better? What am I going to work on next time? And it can be all sorts of things like the way that I regulated the room's temperature or the way that I greeted students when they were coming in or the music that I played or the way that I did my sequencing. There's so many different things that I can tweak every time I teach to work on that skill. So self-reflection is probably one of the best skills that you can cultivate as a yoga teacher so that you can do that continuous lifelong learning and continuously working on your skills. It's always something <laughs> that we can work on. So the area right in between here, between relationship and connection and the postures and the anatomy, 
there's some things that I filled in there, karma yoga being one of them, because karma yoga is the yoga of service, of it could be like volunteer work, it could be just offering your teachings to somebody who is in need or could benefit from them. A lot of yoga studios will pair up with different charities or do trips to other countries to offer opportunities to do volunteer work as part of karma yoga. And that is using your physical body and using your skills to create relationship and connection with a positive outcome. It exists right in that intersection between what we can do with our physical body and what is possible when we take care of ourselves and we're healthy so that we can go out and be of service and be useful. A big part of that too is the self-awareness because if we lack self-awareness we probably won't be as effective when we go out to offer those skills and we won't be as good at taking care of ourselves if we don't understand our own boundaries and our own limitations in terms of when we need to take a break or when we need to step back and focus on self-care so that we don't burn out. This seems like a, a strange topic as a yoga teacher, like you kind of imagine being a yoga teacher is like always fun and wonderful and you just do yoga all day and you're so relaxed, but there's actually a lot, a lot of yoga teachers who have been in the field for years that start to get burnt out and they start to feel stuck and sometimes end up leaving the profession because they just feel like the hours that they have to spend teaching maybe to make enough money to sustain themselves is just too much effort for what they're getting from it and then they end up with burnout. So that's definitely something to keep in mind because when we go through that process of educating a teacher a teacher and getting them into the field of yoga and putting all of this work in we want to make sure that that person is able to sustain themselves for a full career as a teacher we need those teachers who have been in the field for 30 40 years and have all that experience if we're burning out after 10 or 15 years we won't have teachers who make it to that end point so self-care and recognizing your needs is the key part of making sure that you don't burn out. A really big thing that we talk about in healthcare is that when you are starting to feel burnout, um, and there's a lot of different symptoms that can be just kind of a lack of interest, not feeling that spark of joy when you're doing what you're doing. Fatigue is a really common feeling, lack of inspiration, all sorts of things can really come from burnout, but when you start to notice that starting to creep in, one of the things that we can do is seek out continuing education. Take a class from a different teacher, learn something new to infuse into your practice, and that a lot of times can bring back that spark of energy. And that kind of swings us down to the subtle body again, understanding that energetic system and sometimes that that agni that internal fire starts to get dull and we need to have the self-awareness to recognize when that's happening and then knowing what can be done to reignite that fire bring it back to a, a healthy level where we feel that passion and that drive to share the teachings of yoga again and that brings me down to the kosha model the kosha model if you're not familiar with that are the layers of our being. It's the model in yoga that we use. It's really the foundation of yoga therapy to see how the layers of a person interact to create one whole functioning being. It's the physical body, it's our energetic body, it is our mind and our intellect, it is our wisdom, it is our joy, and then wrapped in all of those layers is our soul or the Atman. And that's the model that we use to look at what a person is made of. And one of the other things that I've really been thinking about lately is how in occupational therapy, we, th we always think about the person in context. So we're not just a person floating in nothing. We are a person that exists in context, in 
this layer of what our roles are, what our external environment is, all of those things are also going to have an impact on those inner layers. So future video is going to be my personal <laughs> view of what the expanded kosha model should look like. So it kind of updates the modern view of people and the ancient view of people and melds those two together, which is really what I'm always trying to do, taking the modern science and the ancient wisdom and bringing those two together to be more effective. So there's a lot going on here and like I said, this is very much still a, a work in progress. I think about this a lot in terms of different components of the skills that we work on as yoga teachers and where it would fit in or what I might have missed. So I would love to hear from you if there's anything that you think should be added to this or any different components that you feel like are really key to being a great yoga teacher, let me know in the comments. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for being here and listening to this new yoga board talk. Thank you.